right, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Astor B. War, War uh, lecture, a series which we continue to promote here at the Democratic Labour Party. Astor, of course, is a rank and file member of this organization, like, all of, like so many of us who would give his all for the party. This is a very important time of the year, of course, in Barbados as we discuss in the House of Assembly the estimates, uh, that is the appropriations for running the country, and I'm sure a number of us will be engaged in trying to listen and monitor, the, listen to and monitor the presentation, both by the members of the government and, of course, now by our opposition leader and political leader of this party, uh, Mr. Ralph Thorne, also, of course, my member of parliament in Christchurch South. Today, we wanted to add to the celebration of African Awareness Month. We know today is the 1st of March, not the 30th of February, as some may want to state, but the 1st of March. But we believe we can beg for your consideration to allow us to extend at least by one day the appreciation of Africa uh, and helping Barbadians to build their awareness. So important is it because we all are derived from the African race. Our story is well chronicled and I'm sure that today as we hear from our guest speaker, uh, she will even expand and probably in more vivid terms as to how it all comes about. We all have African uh, contacts, and I think I should say a little bit about myself and my uh, association with Africa. I have a sister who is about 79 years old, but she's lived all of her graduate life on the continent of Africa, working for the World Health Organization and the uh, FAO uh, in agriculture and in food technology. She worked briefly in Barbados, Joyce is her name, she worked briefly in Barbados as a food technologist with the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and I believe, and may have known of her a very brief stint, but I think about 18 months. Uh, she was married to a gentleman from the Republic of Dahomey at that time, I think it was called Cotonou uh, uh, now, Benin Republic, uh, and they have two children, and they're also continuing to work on the continent of Africa, the daughter, in the same field as her mom, and of course the son who works in Canada. I say that to say that I've had the opportunity to travel in Africa a little bit, and I enjoyed that trip. Uh, my wife reminds me it was about 1985 that I did almost a mini safari in Africa, so we all have our contacts with Africa, and I'm sure there are many stories which all of us can tell. Today, however, we have the good fortune of listening to a presentation from a Barbadian woman. Her name is Gillian Downs Aline, and she was born in 1970 in Ilford, Essex in the United Kingdom. Her mother returned to Barbados a few months later, so Gillian was probably wrapped in swaddling clothes when she, when she came back to Barbados in 1971 with Gillian and her siblings who are here with her, at least two of them that I've met, Carol and Sandra, who are here as a support team, she says, and there to keep her on the straight and narrow way as she does her presentation. And she resided here with her maternal grandparents in St. Andrew. Gillian attended St. Andrew's Girls School. It doesn't have a different name now? Oh, there you are, Ada Costed was quite, it was, when I read it, but I was a little unfamiliar with this in Andrews Girls School, but Ada Costed was school, there you are. Uh, Commonware School, we all know about Commonware and how proudly they wear their flag in Barbados, and as, as, they, as they should, up, up and up, that's the word. <laughs> Newham Community College in the United Kingdom, and of course the Barbados Community College. While attending the University of the West Indies Cape Campus, she won levels one, two, and three awards for history. And in 2014, 
received her Bachelor of Arts degree in history with first class honors. She was also awarded the Elsa Gouveia Scholarship later that year, which allowed her to further her studies. She received her PhD in history in 2023, and she's married to Trevor Allen, so uh, resides with him and their two adult sons, Gerald and Jorin, in the parish of St. James. So let us join hands and welcome our lady of the day, Dr. Gillian Downs Allen, as she does her presentation to us. And it's entitled, it's entitled Barbados's Engagement with Apartheid South Africa, 1951 to 1954. 1994, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for that warm welcome. All right. I want, I want to express my thanks and appreciation for allowing me to share a small portion of my research today. It is the first time I am presenting publicly since acquiring my PhD, and I'm nervous but excited. <laughs> I, I pray that the presentation today will be short enough to be interesting, but long enough to cover the important points. The idea for this study, and it's entitled Barbados' Engagement with Apartheid Southern Africa, 1951 to 1994, came about as I read an essay claiming that the English-speaking Caribbean did little in the fight against, against apartheid. I admit this piqued my interest. I wanted to know more. So when I say Southern Africa, um, I examined specific events between Barbados and Angola, which was invaded by South Africa, Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, which was governed in a similar style to South Africa um, from 1965 to 1979 under the Ian Smith Unilateral Declaration of Independence, UDI, and Namibia, which was annexed by South Africa. But the focus of the presentation will be on South Africa. 1951 was demarcated by two events which provided stimuli for relations between Barbados and South Africa. And in 1994, South Africa held its first multiracial elections. Right. So I want to, my argument here is that in 1951, the Barbados government was at the forefront of the campaign to isolate South Africa and this became a reality with the introduction of trade sanctions in 1960, while still a colony. This stance was maintained through several multilateral agreements, both at the United Nations and at the Commonwealth, over the 33 years this study encompassed. Barbados and Barbadians have demonstrated some level of commitment to the liberation and transformation of Southern Africa, and in the terms of the government, wavered little in the struggle to dismantle apartheid and to promote the building of effective administration in places like Namibia. Nevertheless, inconsistencies did occur because of decisions made by some Barbadians, which caused consternation. Hence, the discussion on racial consciousness and identity emerged. Um, my analytical framework was black internationalism or pan-Africanism, and Hakim Adi admits that the term pan-Africanism is difficult to define, but that it concerns itself with the social, economic, cultural, and political emancipation of African peoples, including those of the African diaspora. However, Michael West and William Martin warns us that as self-determination became equated with state sovereignty, black identities increasingly assume a national, even nationalism form. Well, Stuart Hall acknowledges that differences in unity exist. And it just existed. I just want to explain this. Pan-Africanism, you're black people throughout the world, wherever you are, you're united, you're so, um, you, you, you work in solidarity because you recognize, because of the color of your skin, because of your race, you're gonna go through different things, colonialism, um, racial injustices, all these things. You recognize that, but as, and you, you, you work to solve this issue. But as black states emerge, as they become independent, and when they say black states, I mean those of a predominantly black population, as they become independent, your country's interests will, be, will take precedence over the, the, um, the Pan-African movement. But Stuart Hall reminds us that that's okay, different states will occur. Not that you're no longer involved in the Pan-African movement, but you, the methods you employ may differ. 
That's all we're saying here. Right, so what is apartheid? Philip Bonner, Peter Delius, and Deborah Postle defines apartheid as an ideology of white racial superiority and segregation. So in South Africa, it was in, implemented in three stages. Basca, with 1948 to 1960, you saw the implementation of stringent laws. Um, you, you removed the right to vote for blacks. The, um, the, the restricted land ownership for blacks and the free movement of persons. And if you look to the, the to the left of your, the right of your screen, you see Milan blocks African from the city areas. So they needed a pass in order to move around freely as a black person, as a non-white person, I should say. Separate development occurred in 1961 to 1973, the development of Bantu stands, where blacks were pushed onto a piece of land, there was separate um, government, and there would be there, more often than not, to provide a labor force for the factories and the mines. And then the last stage was negotiation. Black labor unions would emerge around the mid 1970s, and Pretoria government would recognize they had to negotiate with these unions in order to acquire labor because they were looking outward now. They were looking to open their markets to the West and other places. Right, so what connects Barbados to South Africa? First thing, they were colonized by Britain. Both of them were colonized by Britain and they had administrators um, in common. Governor Milner worked in South Africa and he also worked in Barbados. Um, British West Indian Regiment was based in South Africa well, during the Boer War, 1898 to 1902. And Barbados were living in South Africa. And I just want to read a brief excerpt from this um, newspaper clipping here to your right. It's about a 116-year-old lady living in South Africa in 1950. And the article states, my pet can remember when slavery was abolished and also recalls the 1914 to the 1918 war. She had a son who died in South Africa as a soldier in 1927. So there's a connection there. Also, Alan Cobley reminds us that in 1904, the Barbinian population in the Cape Colony was 65 persons, 34 black males, 22 white males, and nine white females. No black women were there, from, at least from Barbados. And then there are five, Bar the five Barbinian seamen were listed among those in South Africa. Henry Thomas Jordan, Peter Benjamin, Will Braswick, Cyril Eunice, and Prince McConney. There was also a Pan-African connection as branches of the Universal Negro Improvement Association would be, would be established in South Africa by Caribbean nationals. And seamen were utilized in the smuggling of the copies of the Negro World, the Negro Worker, and the International African Opinion. These were newspapers of Pan-African organization, hence the connection I have here, Pan-Africanism. Right. So in 1951, J.T. Branca, a, a member of parliament, tabled a resolution to censor the racial policies of South Africa and implement economic sanctions. Paragraph three of the resolution called for the control board of Barbados to rescind any licenses on imports from South Africa. However, the, the resolution would only pass after the removal of this paragraph. So Barbados was not ready to implement sanctions at this time, but at least they were contemplating it. They were thinking about it. And the second event will be the death of Barbadian seaman Milton King. And we have a picture here on the right of King and his family and his, his children and his wife. King was beaten by two South African police officers and he was later succumbed to his injuries around the fourth of 5th of March. So J.T. Branca had tabled the resolution on the 6th of March. King had died around the 4th or the 5th. So these incidents kind of converged, okay? So Parliament debated the way forward. What were they going to do? It was a very heated debate at that time. Right. So the BWU would organize a protest march. On August the 25th, 1951, the union would organize a demonstration and particip participants would be seen with the placard stating, don't be dukes, boycott South African goods. Don't buy Jim Crow wear. One Barbadian murdered, fascists must go. 
So protesters conflated, rightly so, what was occurring in the USA with events in South Africa. Because as we know, Jim Crow laws were practicing segregation in the USA as well. But protests would not be exclusive to Barbados as other regional unions would lead demonstrations. And in the United Kingdom, the excerpt from the article, the clipping from the newspaper here, the, the League of Colored People, a Pan-African organization, also sought to organize a protest march. In South Africa, there's going to be reaction. There's going to be news about what Barbados did in South, um, in South Africa. And a newspaper clipping states this. A Cape Town exporter had received a letter from the Bridgetown firm saying that quite a situation had developed there following King's death. The letter says the local trade unions of waterside workers and lighter men is threatening to retaliate by refusing to unload or handle any cargo from South Africa. So even in South Africa, they are interested in what was happening here in Barbados. So the outcome of King's death, out of the two policemen, only one was fined, and he was fined 10 pounds. Killing, a, as Beijing would say, a whole man. 10 pounds, right? And while the other one became a state witness. There was a loss to King's family, as he was the main breadwinner. And the government of Barbados would seek compensation for King's family, um, around 1,800 pounds. Um, was paid to the government. His widow received half of that, half of that amount. It increased the, the scrutiny on South Africa because as King's death made the lives more, made, made persons in Barbados look to South Africa and what was happening there. And the, the, the calls for trade, trade sanctions increased. However, at this time, Barbados still did not implement any. So now I want to look at trade and foreign policy and how Barbados will conduct, conduct themselves as a colony before 1966 and then after as an independent nation. So in 1954, and this is important, Barbados would attain control of its internal affairs and in, inexplicably control of its trade, because we know trade is usually attached to foreign policy, right? Right. But this will be important as events unfolded within South Africa, and we see here Barbados will also become members of these various organizations, the United Nations and Commonwealth, and there are other events we will look at um, in terms of Barbados' foreign policy. Right. The road to sanctions. Jamaica in, in July, I think it was around the 2nd of July, implemented trade sanctions. They didn't even argue about it, they just implemented it. Then the West Indies Trade Minister would attend a meeting, those from Barbados, Grenada, throughout the West Indies, a trade, a trade minister meeting at the end of July, and they would discuss there and then how they're going to implement or discuss, they will go back to the countries in the, in the West Indies and push to have trade sanctions implemented. Frank Walker, the leader of the Barbados Workers' Union at that time, he would attend a meeting in Nigeria with other trade unions in November, 19, in November 1959. But the catalyst, the catalyst for trade sanctions was the Sharpeville massacre. On the 21st of March 1960, a demonstration organized by the Pan-Africanist Congress for Black South Africans to surrender their passes turned deadly as police officers opened fire. 69 persons died and 180 persons were wounded. The brutality of the Sharpeville massacre invigorated renewed calls for sanctions in Barbados. Increased pressure was placed on the Minister of Trade, Mencia Cox, by the opposition Democratic Labour Party, the Barbados Workers' Union, along with growing awareness among Barbadians to make sanctions official. The BWU will go ahead and implement their own unofficial ban because they will tell their members do not handle any goods coming from South Africa and Antigua would implement their, their um, sanctions as well. Barbados still had them in March. But they're going, to be re they're going to argue, some of the arguments were, but why are we not um, implementing sanctions? If you look at the screen, 1951 to 1956, because there, there are not a lot of figures you can get, but I was, I was able to attain um, our trade between South Africa and ourselves, 1951 to 1956. And the most that we've, we've imported, the highest imports we had from South Africa was $519,626. And this occurred in 1955. 
But if we look at our exports to South Africa, the highest was $471 in 1953. So you see the disparity and why persons were calling, well, implement the sanctions. There's no reason why we shouldn't, okay? But I remember I said the BW would impose a, a ban on handling goods. So this is gonna be effective. Because within Barbados, there was, there, was there was pressure to adhere to the BW's ban, a heightened vigilance occurred. Woolworth was accused of removing the labels of its goods. This prompted the company to take out a full page ad. Do you imagine this? Barbados, the, the, the trade sanctions, the trade embargo that the BW placed here, the unofficial one, it was not even a government led one. It was so effective that Woolworth, this was a big company, right? International company had to take out a full page ad in Barbados because persons in Barbados were watching them. So they took out this ad and, and they said that Barbados, to assure Barbadians that this was not the case. They were not removing labels. Right. But there was some opposition to sanctions. Um, some of the businessmen claimed that, you know, if you import it from somewhere else, it's too expensive for housewives. You know, you, they're washing the housewives' pocket. So let us continue to import from South Africa. And then the colonial government administration and the governor, they were not supportive of sanctions in any case. Within South Africa, we see that the boycott, if you look at, this is an excerpt from the Rand Daily Mail, a South African newspaper. We see that the boycott was, a, was effective there as well. Because here you have a shoe manufacturing company in Marisburg. And they said they could not ship the 800 pairs of shoes and also they had to retrench a hundred of their workers. So we see boycott was effective. The federal, the, sorry, the Federated Chamber of Industries in South Africa too also felt it prudent to dispatch a goodwill mission to the West Indies. So it's like the Barbados Chamber of Commerce, the South Africa Chamber of Commerce, it was like that. They sent a mission here to the West Indies because the boycott was, they, was, they were beginning to feel it, it was effective, yeah? But in, sorry, right. Nevertheless, the 1st of September, 1960, Barbados officially imposed a trade embargo on South African goods. The third territory in the English-speaking Caribbean to do so, remember Jamaica did it first, then Antigua, and Barbados would do it on the 1st of September, 1960. Comparatively, in 1965, Barbados will move with alacrity in the implementation of sanctions against the Ian Smith-led government in Rhodesia because there would be a, a trade boycott against Rhodesia as well. So now we come to independence. You're, you're now in control of your foreign policy. So what are we gonna do? Multilateralism was the approach most often used by Barbados in the fight against apartheid. And none of the administrations really departed from this. But they, we see here they joined a numerous organization, the United Nations, the Commonwealth, and non-aligned movement. Right. So although Barbados would support many of the various resolutions in regards to um, apartheid, it was not against upgraded the United Nations. In 1967, Frank Walker lambasted the Ad Hoc Committee on Namibia, claiming they were dragging their feet, because he was asking, what are you doing? You know, Namibia was not owned by South Africa. You were given it under the UN. You, you can take back control of, of Namibia. And while Seymour Beckles, he, in 1975, confronted the United Kingdom and the USA on Rhodesia. Barbadian Besley Maycott, the gentleman here to your right on the bottom, he would chair the ad hoc committee on apartheid in sports. And to your left, you have two Namibian police graduates. Policemen, Namibian policemen were trained in Barbados and joined Namibia's first multiracial elections in March 1990. Barbadian policemen would be, would be deployed there. Scholarships were provided for Southern African students at the Barbados Community College, and Barbados contributed to several of the UN funds, and their whole list of them are there on the left. Right. So in 1975, South Africa would invade Angola after Portugal um, withdrew. 
because Portugal was the colonial power of Angola. And South Africa was becoming increasingly isolated because they're having more and more black independent states emerging. So they would invade Angola. South Africa would lend its support to the UNITA. Now there are two factions, well, two larger factions fighting, UNITA and the MP MPLA. So South Africa would lend support to UNITA, while the USSR and Cuba will back the MPLA. From September until December 1975, Barbados facilitated the refueling of Cuban planes and the airlift of Cuban soldiers to and from Angola. Prime Minister Barrow claimed that he had no knowledge of this, but this was disingenuous of, as Barrow was once a pilot. Two, he was the first prime minister and foreign minister, and the size of Barbados made this virtually impossible. And you can imagine when a flight is coming from the air, you can hear it, right? So imagine 50 of those flights coming from September to December. It would, not, it would be something that he would know about. But the USA would place pressure on Barbados to halt this activity. He would later admit to Frederick Smith, one of his cabinet ministers, that he did not want them implicated, so he never told them. So this, this helped the, the Angola um, fight then. Right. Then Barbados, as a member of the Commonwealth, of the Commonwealth um, they became a signatory to the Glen Eagles Agreement. And I'll give you a little background on why this occurred. In 1976, there was, um, the Olympics game was held in Canada. Prime Minister Trudeau was, he was embarrassed because the African nations boycotted it and so did Guyana. He did not want a repeat re performance because he was gonna host the Commonwealth Games in Canada as well. So he convened a meeting of all Commonwealth heads of government. And we see we have Prime Minister um, Tom Adams, the third from your left? Yes, yes. right, right. So the, Glen, so the Barbados became a signatory to the Glen Eagles Agreement, which discouraged sporting contact with South Africa. But it was left up to each co country on how they would discipline its citizens should they float the agreement, the third party principle. That's what it's called, the third party principle. So you could, you determine however you're gonna punish your, your citizens. There's also um, under the Commonwealth, the Nassau Accord. Now this was a meeting that occurred um, between the Commonwealth House of Government in Nassau around 1985. And the heads of government were placed, they placed pressure on the United Kingdom Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, who refused to impl implement harsher sanctions on South Africa because South Africa was its fifth largest trading partner. So she had a lot to lose and she wasn't willing to do that. I should say, yeah. So the eminent persons group was a compromise, the EPG. Barbadian Dame Nita was the only woman selected and she would disguise herself as a South African woman to escape her hotel and meet with South African women to get a first hand account. Yeah, so she was able to do that and be on the ground to see what was happening there. So that is important, although it was not a bar. Barbadian initiative, Barbadian citizen. Yes. 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 He was he was part of that because it was a USA Canadian and they were based in Barbados to, to test these, this large gun in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with Barbados was, we were prime location to test this, this gun. And eventually the USA and Canada would withdraw and he would set up his own company, the Space Research Corporation in Barbados in 1970. It was later learned that he bought the shell casings from the USA, took them to Canada, they were later exported to Barbados and tested at the site, at the SRC testing site. And I think they were shipped either through Guyana, sorry, not at Guyana, Antigua, on to Israel, where they'd be filled and eventually made their way to South Africa, and South Africa would use them against Angola. So we see how Barbados was implicated in this, this um, tr illegal trade of arms. But Tom Adams in the press, the US press was, comp was um, saying that accusing Barbados of being complicit in the matter, but Prime Minister Adams said, nope, 
de declared Barbosa's in innocence and any wrongdoings of, um, uh, of the SRC, Bose Company, was expelled in 1978. And in 1978, beginning of January, the 9th of January, they would send a dispatch to the United Nations informing them that Barbados was not floating the tra um, illegal trade arms embargo that they had, the trade embargo they have of arms. So Barbados made sure they, they defended themselves. Right. So we've spoken, a, I've spoken quite a bit on the government um, side, so I'm going to look at other persons who were connected to South Africa. And we have here three seamen. They're not the only ones I interviewed. I interviewed some more, but I, don't, I can't find the pictures. I'm sorry. Right? So we have, we'll go with these three. So these seamen, they're important because they provided an eyewitness account as they recounted personal incidents in which they ran afoul of the apartheid laws. Their experiences in South Africa were enlightening. Examples sitting in the wrong area in the bus, they had to remove. Someone was sitting in the front, and he was sitting there, and the driver just sat and looked at him, and he was like, what are you looking at me for? And the, the person, the, another black person in the bus had to tap and say, you're sitting in the wrong side, you're sitting in the front. Blacks are supposed to sit in the back. So, they had, so he, he moved to the back. Then um, another person recounted that they were removed from a white-only restaurant. They went in the restaurant, can't, couldn't read the, the language, so they sat in this restaurant and the police came and escorted them out. But they said the policemen were nice. They were very pleasant at that time. And they told them, well, make sure you get, into the, get back on the ship before curfew. Remember, blacks were not allowed to be in the town area after a certain time because that's why they have the pass. All right, they would not have had a pass. And no one can recognize a black West Indian from a black South African male, so, so you have to be careful. So then they run into trouble visiting the young ladies' homes. You know, they're friends, because more often than not, there were um, housekeepers in white homes, and this was dangerous as well, because if they find you in that home and you were not working for them, that, that will put you in danger. Sometimes they floated the curfew. But the interesting one I, I found was taking a taxi to a bar. One gentleman said they called the taxi man to come to collect them to go to this particular um, non-white bar. And when the, police, when the taxi man pulled up, he was white. So they said, well, we're not supposed to mix with you. You're, you're white. And the, the taxi man said, I have a wife. I have children. Get in the car, roll up the windows, I take you. As the young people tell you, money got to make. <laughs> yes, he has to go. So when, he got to the, when they got to the bar, the, um, the taxi driver said, I'll give you my number, give it to the proprietress. When you're ready, I'll come back and collect you and take you back to the ship. So on, right, on arrival to the, to the, um, the bar, they, they were greeted by the proprietress. She said, oh, where are you from? She said, she, they said, we're from Barbados. She said, I'll fix you up. I have something for you. And I hope this will play now. <laughs> this is who, Drayton Stu, right? Come here to drink milk, right. So you see how culture transcends even boundaries, yeah, right. So he was he was he was very happy to see that that they were playing his music, but it was very interesting interviewing them. I can't go into detail all the interviews, but it was really interesting because they had first-hand account, and one of them actually lived there for six weeks because he he got ill, so he had to stay back. The ship left him, and he was there for six weeks. Imagine living in South Africa; that was quite a story, right. So now we come to the Barbadian cricketers. And I don't want to spend too much time because there's so many articles on the Barbadian cricketers. But I just want to point out some of the, the connection. They had the Barbados versus the rest of the world tour in 1967. Garfield Sowers will play in Rhodesia under the UDI, the Unilateral Indi um, Independence, Declaration of Independence um, Government in 1970. John Shepherd became the first black man to play on a mixed team, the Derek Robbins 11, in 1973 in South Africa. Because before South Africa would stop you, they didn't want mixed teams coming to play with their white players. Then you had the Glen Eagles dilemma for Barbados with Robin Jackman affair. 
Um, Robert Jackman was a South African player on the English team, and he was banned in Guyana because of the Guyana Eagles agreement. And Barbados, they allowed him to play because, um, and Michael Manley's eyes, he said, both were correct. Because remember I told you the third party principle, you determine how you will punish someone. And you cannot punish another person's citizen. At, at least you could, you could or you could not. It was up to you how you interpret that, that principle. And then everyone knows in 1983, um, Vaccine's 11 tour to South Africa, 1983 to 1994. But I also want to remind you that Barbados will play against South African cricketers in the English county cricket, they, when they play on the county cricket. Right. But I want to quickly look at the 1967 tour. Um, this was organized by the BCA, Barbados Cricket Association, in 1967 to celebrate Barbados' first year of independence. And it was called Barbados versus the rest of the world. And the rest of the world would be, could be anyone. And an invitation was extended to three Southern African players, Colin Bland from Rhodesia and the two Pollock brothers, Graham and Peter Pollock. Now, as you can see from the clippings, Barbados is going to be divided. A couple persons said, said, well, you knew that they were from these countries. Why did you invite them? Persons complained, but Barbados was operating in a similar fashion because some of our cricket clubs were not integrated at that time in 1967. And then persons were, were saying, but let them play. So Barbados was up in arms. But the invitation would be withdrawn because of Basil D. R. and the face saving measure because of Basil D. Oliveira. Basil D. Oliveira was a mixed race South African man. He had moved to the United Kingdom and was playing for England. England had organized a tour with South Africa, but the Pretoria government had said, we are not playing against any mixed race, any team with any, with any mixed race team. And because he was not pure white, they would not play against England, and England would withdraw from that match, and so Barbados would withdraw their invitation from the South Africans. Right. So we want to look at, now at the work, the work of the non-governmental organizations, because we cannot overlook or underestimate the work of the NGOs in Barbados in the anti-apartheid campaign. Um, we had, and they were not largely subscribed to. These were very small, the membership was very small. Right? You have the PPM, the People Progressive Movement. They would actually they informed they held a public meeting on South Africa in nineteen sixty seven regarding the the cricketers coming to Barbados. And they also published a, a newspaper called the Black Star, where they had numerous articles of um, what was happening in South Africa. They informed and taught persons about what was happening in Africa, South Africa and in Barbados too, in terms of racial consciousness. They were, they were part of that movement. Then you have the Southern African Liberation Committee and Monali together. On your, your left, the, the, to the screen up there, you have the SALC. They were protesting the Robert Jackman affair back then outside the British High Commission. And they were very important in, work of, in terms of the work of the anti-apartheid here. Uh, campaign in Barbados. They wrote an expose on Jerobo and the SRC. They first brought the news on the cricketers going to South Africa because an ANC member living in Nigeria would inform them. So they had a network with pan-African organizations outside of Barbados as well. They hosted persons from Southern Africa, Namibia. They provided materials for South African students in Cuba. And they organized demonstrations, public lectures, films, they used the network, the mouthpiece of Manali, which was called Break Loose at the time, to publish their letters. And their, um, they, they had numerous letters to the editor. So this is a small organization. I'm going to tell you, very small, but they were able to do a lot. All right? Under the BWU, under Frank Walker, his obituary read that he was a member of numerous anti apartheid committees. The ILO wrote that in his. Um, obituary, and he utilized his mouthpiece, the Unionist, which was published by the Barbados Workers Union, and he also had a column in the Union Speak. And remember, in 1960, he honored um, his leadership. The Barbados Workers Union would first ban their members from handling South African good, goods. 
so they worked tirelessly. The Barbados Christian Council there would organize a march in 1985, and it was approximately about 3,000 persons attended that march. It was relatively large for Barbados at that time. And now I want to look at the renaming of Farley Hill. And when we, do, when we discuss South Africa Barbados relationship, we're going to discuss race, culture, and identity. Because persons are going to ask us, who are we? Are you, how do you connect to Africa? Right? So in February 1990, the Free South African Committee organized a cultural salute to Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela had been released that same month. And it was during this celebration, the renaming of Farley Hill was proposed to commemorate, to commemorate this. It divided Barbados in two. There was an offer of land um, somewhere else for the park to be, to be established. The committee refused and said, why are we holding on to these uh, colonial icons? Why, not, why must it remain as it, as it was? So per, Barbados will be divided. Persons accused them of fanning the flames of racism. Some said Nelson Mandela had no connection to Barbados. Others stated that we had, name, um, we had names of persons who had little connection to Barbados, such as President Kennedy Drive, and this debate was unnecessary. Others felt there should be a compromise. We named Farley Hill after Milton King because he was a Barbadian or the building should be refurbished and renamed after Nelson Mandela while the park retained, it, retained its name Farley Hill. However, it was not until 2017 the Mandela Freedom Park was opened at the University Drive as a tribute to Nelson Mandela and his daughter was in attendance. So finally, I just want to say this, on March the 17th, Sorry, on March the 17th, 7, 1992, Frederick William de Klerk, the president of South Africa, he would hold a referendum on whether South Africa would seek to reform the structure of its country with the dismantlement of apartheid. The referendum was successfully carried, and South Africa would engage in its first all-race elections in April 1994. Barbados would establish diplomatic ties with South Africa on January the 4th, 1994. So I just want to state that in relation to Southern Africa, Barbados and Barbadians exhibited racial consciousness and stood in solidarity with the numerous pol policies adopted at the international level, that is the United Nations and the Commonwealth. In addition, the contribution, contribution of Barbadian progressives and or pan-African groups such as the PPM, SALC, Manali, the Barbados Christian Council, and the BWU cannot be underestimated in the anti-apartheid fight. I thank you for your list, for listening today. Thank you very much. Um, Jillian, and it was for me a very interesting lecture. It brought back some long lost memories, of course, of the, in the 1960s, maybe even before. And then, of course, the era which I would have lived through as a young man uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, until we are now. We are actually now in a period where we are are we observing almost a reversal of some of the same historical uh, activities that we saw our forefathers and uh, early Barbadian politicians and negotiators and, and indeed freedom fighters fight for as the world continues to spin on its own axis? It must be that because it certainly uh, is very interesting times. We look at the politics, not only of South Africa itself, but of countries which we have long associated with stability of some sort, uh, United Kingdom, United States of America, to some extent, Canada. We don't know, I, I don't know much about Europe, but even Europe, the little bit that I hear. So I really want to thank you, Gillian, for the interesting presentation which you, you made. What we're going to do is, if there are questions, uh, we, we can pose it. What I'll do is ask Jillian to just take the question so I won't have to be up and down all the time and if until the end of the session. So we take a few questions 
and we hope you have some interesting uh, anecdotes for us. Eh? Thank you. Let me have uh, Yes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for sharing that information. You're welcome. I want to ask again to get some clarity on the car matter mm -hmm. because I was an issue and that was a major issue in my really? And uh, our recollect my recollection was that Barrow or Ray Exxon and Warden was seeking to help the Angola. Mm -hmm. I am not sure what position I'm hearing. So I'll answer the first one. Thank you for the question. I'll answer the first one. Yes, Farrell was on the side of the MPLA. That's mm -hmm. why he allowed them to Cuba to refuel here. The Cuban plane, sorry, to be refueled here. But he understood that um, the hegemonic politics, the Cold War politics, the Cold War was going on at that time. Yeah, we, we have the, um, we were in the USA backyard. Cuba was communist and so was the USSR. USA would, would not countenance um, anyone supporting anyone that was considered communist. And the MPLA were, were, con were that way. Now, South Africa would sell themselves as a person of democracy. We're fighting for democracy. We're against communism. So obviously, the NATO leaders would be on South Africa's side. But Barrow, in his, in his wisdom, he didn't want everyone to be implicated with him. So he, he pretended, oh, I didn't know. But he knew, because they couldn't have done it without his permission. He was Mr. Foreign Policy. And I think that's what Oscar Jordan, as one of them, called him Mr. Foreign Policy. So how could you do that? He was a pilot. He knew what was happening, but he didn't want to implicate him. And yes, he was trying to help Angola free themselves from South Africa's invasion. Yes. The second thing you, you, talk, you asked was um, the Zimbabwe. I don't know much about um, Barbados connection unless it was at the United Kingdom and Commonwealth. That I, not not a unilateral uh, position. Only in 1965 they did. Um, when Ian Smith first implemented his government, Britain was not happy. So Britain asked its, its colonies to support them by by implementing trade a trade ban. So that is what they would do, and that's why. Um, so Gary got some backlash when he went to Rhodesia in 1970. Not that um, Barbados, were, Barbados were kind, they love Sir Gary. So they forgave him quickly, quickly for that faux pas, yeah? But I, 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 my research haven't shown any, any direct, like how it did for Angola, any direct connection except with the training of the Namibian police officers and, and then some of the our police officers will go there join the the um, the independence. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Comments?
why not? Thank you, thank you for that comment. And it, and it was it was good. It's interesting to see because this is really now in 2024. Ten years later, someone else may come along and find something else, and that's good because history. And I wanted, to, I, I'm sorry, these students right here, that history is never static. As persons do more research, you're going to uncover and discover more things. But I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you. But let me let me say thank you very much to Dr. Jingin Downs Aline for a very interesting and like from the questions though there were only three questions and comments, you could see that there is a part of this story which is being rekindled in our minds and this is interesting and I, I reflected for a moment. I'm going to say uh, here's an opportunity I think for us to utilize some of our younger historians yeah. in Barbados so that they can bring a, a new perspective onto what we might have been treated in the same way for so long. And this is not any, in any way, uh, you know, casting any uh, doubts on the work of our historians before, but it is refreshing and I'm sure that Gillian will probably tell us about many others, even younger than ourselves, who are taking this refreshing new approach to the whole question of the history of, of the Barbados, the Caribbean, and indeed the world. And as Gillian hinted, history is not static. And you know, there are a lot of things which we even have to talk about now that are going to impact us even in a, a much more definitive way in the very near future. So I think uh, Gillian has opened the proverbial can of worms in our thought processes. And I, I think, as uh, uh, again, one of the questions indicated, there, there must be an opportunity where we bring, bring you back, Gillian, of course, with your, with your permission to probably make a presentation at one of our conferences. It doesn't have to be necessarily this topic. I'm sure, as a historian, you, you, you work in all other very interesting areas, and I think this is an opportunity for us to open a really new vein of knowledge for our members and to continue to attract our younger members. Jillian, I want to say on behalf of the Democratic Labour Party, the committee of the Astor B 
uh, Watts Lecture Series. Thank you very much. We wish you well in your career. And thank you to your sisters, of course, who came to support you. It was a really family afternoon. Thank you very much, Gillian.